Hello, everybody. I'm Kim Goff Cruz, Secretary and Vice President for University Life and the Senior Officer in Charge of the Belonging at Yale Initiative. This event is the first in a series of events on anti racism that is being done in conjunction with the Belonging at Yale Initiative. This is the university's major initiative to create a climate of belonging for all of us faculty, students, staff, and alumni. The series is open to all staff, students, faculty, and alumni. And on December 2nd, we'll host our second speaker, Dr. Ibrahim X. Kendi, historian and author of How to Be an Anti-Racist. Today, over 800 people registered for this conversation, and most of our guests are staff, so special welcome to you. Many thanks to Deborah Stanley McCauley, who is the Associate Vice President for Employee Engagement and Workplace Culture, and of course, her team for their generous support of this event. Our guest today is Dr. Dolly Chug, social psychologist, NYU Stern School of Business Associate Professor, and the author of The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias. In her book, Dr. Chug provides practical applications to evidence-based research that can help us address our own biases in our personal lives and in our workplace. She helps us understand how we can be better by practicing vulnerability, understanding our privilege, making mistakes, and learning from them with a growth mindset. She reminds us that we have things to learn, all of us. We are not always the people we mean to be, or even think we are, but most of us are good people trying to do better. Dr. Lori Santos will facilitate the conversation and will incorporate questions that have been submitted in advance. Now, she doesn't need an introduction, but I am gonna say a few words for the few of you who don't know her. Dr. Santos is a Yale professor of psychology and head of Silliman College. She hosts the very popular podcast, The Happiness Lab, and is the director of the Comparative Cognition Laboratory and the Canine Cognition Center at Yale. Her course, Psychology and the Good Life, is the most popular course ever taught at Yale. It's my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Santos to introduce Dr. Chug and begin what I know is going to be a really informative conversation. Thank you so much, Kim, for that introduction. And thanks so much for having me at this first panel on belonging at Yale. I'm so, I'm super thrilled to be part of it. Um, Kim already gave you a quick introduction to Dolly Chug's work, but since I love her and her work so much, I couldn't help but kind of tell you a little bit more about what she's been up to. Um, as mentioned, Dolly is an associate professor at New York, at, at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, but her work really focuses on this problem of what it means to be a good person and the psychological mechanisms that make up being a good person. Um, her book, The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias is one of my favorite books out there. Um, and you should definitely check it out. You should also check out her newsletter, uh, which is called Dear Good People. You can sign up at dollychug.com slash newsletter. Better. And it is fantastic because while her book is a whole host of insights and a book length worth of wonderful tips for how you can kind of fight bias all the time, her newsletter will give you one actionable tip every single time you receive it. And it's a fantastic way to kind of keep up with your anti-racism efforts. Um, but it's also worth noting just how important Dolly has been in this fight so far and just how much of an impact she's had. Um, as with most people, Dolly has had an amazing number of accolades, way too many to list here. But it's worth noting that she is listed as one of the top 100 most influential influential people in business ethics by Ethisphere magazine. Um, I'll point out that this is a list that also includes people like Pope Francis, Angelina Jolie, and Bill Gates. You get a sense of her uh, kind of influence here. Um, she's also an amazing teacher. She's been one of the most highly rated business school professors at NYU for a long time. And just this year, she received the 2020 NYU Distinguished Teaching Award. Um, she's just an amazing teacher and an amazing mentor and an amazing person in terms of her impact. And today we're really gonna kind of dive deep into her work. We're gonna talk not just about the kinds of things we need to do to focus on becoming better people, but we're gonna explore how her work demonstrates that all of us really need to step it up if we wanna kind of create the change that we wanna see in our world. You know, if we wanna have just societies and just organizations and just universities, then we really need to do something. And one of the things we need to do is to understand the biases that we're all walking around with. We need to hack those biases and understand how they work so that we can become better people. And so with that, I'm super excited to introduce Dolly. I'm such a huge fan and I'm thrilled that Yale has brought her here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dolly Chug. Oh, hi, Lori. Thanks so much for coming again. Oh my um, God. 
So, so I wanted to start out with maybe what's an obvious question. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of people on this call, but I, I hope I can speak for all of them when I say that everybody on this call like truly cares about equity. Like everybody on this call, I hope, believes that people from all races, all ethnicities, you know, all, all body statuses, all that stuff should be treated equally. But what you argue in your book is that that belief in equity isn't enough and is in fact part of the problem. So walk me through why believing isn't enough. Oh, okay, great. Thank you for having me, Lori, colleagues. It's wonderful to be here. Um, well, I, I talk about this difference between being a believer and a builder. And I say this from a place of frankly, seeing myself in exactly what I'm about to describe. So um, as you just listed, there's a whole range of ways in which a lot of us want to see equality and even equity in the world around us. And we believe that's what we what what should happen. We also are believers that that doesn't exist. So we don't have to be convinced. Uh, we, we may not be deeply informed on every issue and every identity, but, but we know that things aren't quite where we want them to be. We're believers in that sense. The challenge, however, is that the status quo doesn't change based on our beliefs necessarily, particularly if our, we're, we're really kind of invested in being the kind of people who believe that. And I, I think I am, I really wanna be the kind of person who um, treats people well, that, that creates opportunities for people who haven't had opportunities. I wanna be that kind of believer. Um, however, in order to do it, I have to build certain things. I have to build knowledge. I have to build skills. I have to build um, systems. I have to build courage. I have to build habits. These are all active um, uh, modes of operating that won't happen just because I believe something. So just because I believe uh, every student in my class at NYU should be treated equally and should have an equal opportunity to succeed in my class, that doesn't mean that I have built a system in which that can happen and what, that I built a classroom in which everyone feels equally welcome, um, that I built a grading protocol in which everyone has the, the possibility to excel, that I've built a culture in which people feel they can come talk to me if they have a question. Those are all actions I have to take. So the distinction between believing and building, or really, I shouldn't call it distinction, the continuum between moving from being a believer to a builder, for me is about taking actions. And the, the challenge with when we don't do that, when we sit in that believer end of the pool, is that we get comfortable. We, we care so much about this issue that we develop an identity as being someone supportive of this issue, but not doing anything about it. And if someone says, hey, how about, you know, I noticed um, there are ways in which maybe you're contributing to the challenge. Like if, if my teaching assistant says to me, mm, I noticed that your calling patterns reflect you calling on men more than women, which happened, uh, that's true, um, th th then I'm going to get defensive because I'm like, well, no, I believe in equity in my classroom. And uh, I, rather than building saying, ah, okay, now I have data. What can I do with this data? What can I do to change my calling patterns? What can I do to make it possible for more people to have their hands up? That's what the builder response is as opposed to the believer response. And I think this is so important because again, you know, I, I'm sure everybody who's coming to this is coming from this place of like caring about this stuff. Yes. I think that's super important that the caring alone, it's not just like not helpful. It could actually be deeply counterproductive to some interesting extent. It, and in fact, it feels like abandonment. I think when, when we're, when we're part of the groups that are dealing with this, if you, if you're, if you're um, a black student at Yale and your white classmates believe in all this, but aren't taking action on it, it feels like abandonment. It, it doesn't feel like support at all. I am not, of course, speaking for everyone, but, but in general, that, that's the perception um, that, that both science and anecdotes would suggest. So that's the danger of being a believer is that, that it, it's, it, it feels uh, shallow. We're in the shallow end of the pool. 
And so you've talked about a couple different ways that we can kind of dive into the deeper end of the pool, right? That there's kind of different ways to be a builder um, with a kind of like, like really hardcore building and a kind of softer type of building. So talk about, in your book, you make this distinction between light and heat, which I think is a really great analogy. So walk me through kind of the light version of building versus the heat version of building. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to preface this by saying it's the most important thing about light and heat is to know that we need both. Uh, let me let me define what each of them mean. I'm using a metaphor I wasn't able to track down who originally came up with this light heat metaphor. It's widely used. Um, the, the idea of when you take a light based approach to, let's say, um, making change in your community or in your institution, you, you meet people where they are you center their comfort, you, um, you educate, you teach, uh, it's, 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 it's slower and it's more incremental. A heat-based approach to making change is one in which by definition, it is not centering the comfort of others. It is pushing, it is disruptive, um, and it's meant to push for change faster and in more dramatic ways. Most of us, my sense is kind of lean in terms of our personal preferences towards more light or more heat. I mean, some people are good at both and comfortable with both, but like I would say, I, I tend to lean towards the light-based approaches. But this was a really, I, I would say probably the most important learning I had from writing this book was realizing that just because I am more comfortable with light doesn't mean that I don't, I shouldn't see the value in heat. What historians have showed us, showed us, historians of social movements, is that when a movement sort of leans heavily on light or leans heavily on heat versus movements that balance both, the movements that balance both make more progress. So the message here, and this is why I feel it was so important for me to learn this, is just because I am a light-based person doesn't mean that I shouldn't be cheering on the heat-based folks. And just because I'm a heat-based folks, he's heat-based person doesn't mean I shouldn't be cheering on the light base. We're, we, we often feel the tactics being used by, by the others aren't what we would do and aren't as effective. But one of the differences that light and heat has and why we need both is that light may be more likely to change minds, but it's probably not gonna change systems. Heat's probably more likely to change systems and less likely to change minds. Well, we need both. We need both our minds and our systems um, to, to, to move in order for real change to happen. And so I think in this work of being a builder, sometimes we preference, you know, because I'm right-handed, I want everyone to be right-handed or because I'm left-handed, I want everybody left-handed. But no, what we want is light-based people to cheer on the heat-based people and heat-based people to cheer on the light-based people. And frankly, it's all good wherever you are in that space, as long as you're not in the inaction, you know, that's back to being a believer. You know, I don't know, let's keep the metaphor going like darkness, if you will, or silence or something. Um, but but the, the, the light and heat are both important. It's particularly important that we cheer on the heat. I think there, I don't have data on this, but I bet there's more light-based people in your community than there are heat-based. And boy, you should be grateful that you have those heat-based folks. That's perfect. And so, I mean, so both of us need to kind of, as you said, get past the darkness. Like we need the light <laughs> and the heat, but people can't be sort of sitting around in the dark. And so right. one, one of the first skill sets you, you present in the book for getting people out of the darkness, and again, the darkness is believing in equity, right? It's like thinking right. about things just not right. being. The, the, the first step is really kind of learning something, right? It's actually recognizing the sorts of privileges that you have. And so yeah. this can be a tricky concept for people who haven't talked a lot about this before. So walk me through this idea of privilege, what that means. Yeah, I, 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 I struggle with this too. Um, it, it's tied a lot to another tricky word, which is systemic. I think these words go hand in hand and, and are hard to understand. The, the metaphor that helped me with that came, comes from Debbie Irving. She uses a metaphor of headwinds and tailwinds that I find really useful. Um, so I, I'm looking over there to make sure my kids aren't eavesdropping because they'll always laugh with the little example I'm about to give you. So, so the, the example is, let's say I was to go running. <laughs> That's when they start laughing. They're like, ha, ah, let's say. Um, so let's say I go running and I say, okay, I'm gonna run you know, to the high school on the corner have a good jog, and then I'm going to U-turn and come right back the way I came. 
And while I'm, I'm making my way over there, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like, hmm, you know, I think this no carb thing's working out. I'm feeling pretty strong, you know, make a good time. And then I turn around for the U-turn and suddenly things feel harder and more effortful. And if someone was just like inside their, their home or office and watching me through a window, they might, if they just see me coming back, be like, hmm, it doesn't even look like she's trying that hard or she doesn't look that motivated or I don't know, maybe she comes from a community that doesn't really value running, I see, you know, she's just not taking it seriously. They wouldn't see what I'm feeling, which is a headwind mm -hmm. in my face on the way back. And on my way there, that tailwind, which was propelling me forward, I didn't even feel, because you don't really feel tailwinds. You, you benefit from them, but you don't feel them. And so the headwinds are more easily felt than the tailwinds and, and, and all of it is sort of invisible in general and hard to see. And that's, I think, a good way to think about what privilege is, is that at any given moment, any one of us has some form of privilege on some form of our, their identities. Like I'm, I'm straight and while I don't, spend a lot of time thinking about my straightness because frankly, I don't have to. The world is kind of, at least the community and the society I live in is makes it pretty easy to be straight. It doesn't create obstacles for me. I have lots of legal rights. I have lots of physical safety. Um, that privilege that I have, that tailwind is one I don't even really think about um, versus the headwind that, that if someone isn't straight, they're constantly navigating. Um, and so when we talk about privilege, what we're really talking about are where do we have tailwinds? And each of us have multiple identities and, and therefore multiple headwinds and tailwinds. And right now, I think in 2020, we've had an opportunity. There's been headwinds. If you are a Black American, um, it, there are headwinds that have been very visible and felt by people in the black community that haven't been felt and seen and experienced by many people outside the black community. And that became visible in a new way in this year for many people. Some people already know. So that, that, that privilege is sort of one in which we're now tuning into in a way that maybe uh, on a widespread countrywide basis we haven't done in the past. But this is kind of the key of these headwinds and tailwinds is that that both, both of them are invisible. It's, I mean, I guess I guess the headwinds are very visible if you're being slowed down by them. Right. right? They're incredibly visible to you. But if you're not from a marginalized identity or, or one of your identities is not marginalized, you just don't see it, right? And, and, and this, what I love about your book is that you point out that this is true for you too, right? Like you do yeah. research on this and it's still hard to see these things. Uh, absolutely. Like I have so many tailwinds and, and, you know, wh whether it, it's um, me not realizing, you know, I'm, I'm the child of Indian immigrants. Um, so I was born in India, but a baby when, when my parents came here and, and I, I you know, I think, I, I don't know what, like, I'm not sure how people identify me. I think I pass as a lot of things um, that, that privileges me. I get, I get considered a person of color in some circles in a way that privileges me when I'm with other people of color. And I think some people see me as white maybe, and I sort of pass in those circles. Um, there's lots of ways, you know, the straightness is another example. I, I think, you know, my education level, my native language, I'm cisgender. Um, none of these identities are better than other identities. I'm not in any way saying I'm lucky to have those identities, but I do incur benefits as a result of those identities, my education, my income level. Um, I, I'm constantly surprised at the things I'm oblivious to, you know, the, the, the fact, um, you know, most recently the, the set of, of awareness that I've gained is around my physical abilities and disabilities um, and realizing there's lots of ways in which I have just not even noticed how the world is not set up for um, students in my community and my classes who are disabled. And that's despite supposed like legal accommodations that we make that really, I can tell you in my classroom have not been sufficient. And so uh, I've just recently realized there's all these ways in which I've made learning harder for my students that I could have been addressing, like using captions on Zoom. Um, like when I was, when we were teaching in person using captions on videos, I mean, those are just two 
two of many ways. Um, so these, this, these privileges that like, that's a headwind I was just not seeing at all. Yeah, and so when you bring up those examples, I think you know everybody who has those cases where they kind of notice like spots where, wow, I was just having it so much easier than I even realized that I'm mm -hmm. making it inadvertently harder for the people around me. And I had some hand in it, right? It's not just the system, like right. the videos I posted for my class had that same feature. You Sometimes like one bad thing about privilege is that it's invisible, but the second bad thing about privilege is that when you notice it, it feels incredibly bad, right? Like even in cases where you didn't have a hand in it, like you feel kind of awful. Like I don't necessarily, I didn't, you know, try to get these tailwinds that are making me speed past everyone. Um, and so, so talk about that feature of privilege, right? Cause I think, you know, a lot of us don't like feeling like we're getting these tailwinds that are kind of helping us out a lot. And, and what does that do to our psychology? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's pretty mortifying, right? Like, and, and there's, there's research that shows that, that we, we, we actually, uh, we, we like to, to, to get things, but we, we sort of like to feel like we, do, we deserve it and we earned it, right? Like we don't like to feel like we unfairly um, got something. And so that, yeah, it feels awful. I, I think what, where we make a lot of headway when we have those moments of insight is if we can sort of in the mental accounting of that noticing, put it in the growth bucket. This, this is a place of growth. And so, you know, one thing I've been um, talking about lately is like, if you can't think about a TV show or a joke or a word that, that you watched or used or laughed at a year ago or five years ago that you're now mortified by, I'm gonna argue you're not growing, you're not learning. If, if you feel like everything you've ever said, done or watched is sort of aligned with who you are now and what you know now, that says to me, there's like this very static, um, you know, brittle, almost good person identity that isn't evolving. Um, in, in most aspects of our life, we try to get better all the time. We try to, you know, you try to, you try a recipe you haven't tried before or at work, you try to master a software system or whatever. Um, in this one area of being a good person though, we view every mistake as, as a complete condemnation, a complete sort of blanket of shame. You know, I, I, I sort of feel myself kind of get warm and sweaty in those moments. Um, but what's really helped me and, and the research by Carol Dweck, psychologist and her co-author supports this, is if we can view things as growth, not, not um, sort of in a fixed mindset as she describes it in which we have nowhere to go, but we actually view Oh, I just noticed like those videos that that was deeply problematic. That was that was something I I should have known. Um, I shouldn't have had to. By the way, there was an email that I probably dismissed about it. Like I really had to be nudged. Um, that that's a moment for me to say, OK, I now know more than I did a year ago and five years ago and I'm acting on it. Um, so I, I think we miss an opportunity to actually feel great about ourselves in that moment, not feel great that we noticed and stopped, but that we noticed and, and learned and mm -hmm. acted. This Sorry. gets to the idea that you talk a lot about in your book about not wanting to be a good person, but being a good-ish person, which I yes. think people can misconstrue when you say, don't worry about being a good person when it comes to <laughs> social justice, right? Like, and explain to me what you mean by good-ish, because I think it's so important. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I've, I've got to be more precise. I, I've learned on that than I've been in the past. Okay, so, so, so the campaign I'm on is to get us to stop trying to be good people, but that's <laughs> not because I want us to lower our standards. I'm actually making the opposite argument that our good person identities are a fixed mindset identity. They're deeply brittle. They're not, there's, there's no stretch there to grow and get better. Um, in a growth mindset, which I, in this domain, I would say is, is called being goodish, we're actually actively looking for those mistakes. It's an Easter egg hunt. They're out there. Go find the candy. Um, candy, that's the wrong, that was a terrible yeah. metaphor, but, but um, go, go find the learnings because when you do, that's where the growth happens. And so this goodish, what I'm defining as goodish is being someone who's actively noticing and actually seeking out those learnings. So, you know, we know from the studies around growth mindset that when you make a mistake in a fixed mindset, we actually see brain activity kind of shut down. You, you actually don't attend to the mistake. You literally withdraw 
mental attention. Um, versus if you're in a growth mindset and you make that mistake, we see boop, 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 all sorts of activity in the brain in a way that suggests like you may be mortified, but boy, are you going to soak up what you can from this moment? And that's soaking up what you can. That's what I mean by goodish. I don't mean like, oh, too bad. Like, I guess I'm not, you know, I mean the exact opposite. Like I am going to own this. Um, thank you for telling me that. Oh, wow. I had no idea. I'm going to go look that up. I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. That's, that's the kind of um, outcome. And that's where this idea that, that kind of feeling like we've messed up feels yucky is problematic because one yeah. thing it can cause us to do is if we don't have mechanisms to have a growth mindset and kind of get over that yucky feeling, it can cause us to do a number of bad things. One of them is just to deny that we've messed up at all, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's of course, you know, the, the most harmful because um, not only are we not learning if, if the context in which that's happening is someone saying, you know, if, 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 uh, if a, I have a student saying to me, you know, I think that reading you assigned, like there, there was just nothing but white uh, voices represented in that reading. And I kind of like dismiss, well, you don't understand my field and, you know, which by the way is exactly the dialogue that goes through my head. <laughs> like, the, How dare you? And don't you know? And, um, but when I can sort of like, whoop, there it is. Those are my red flags. Those are my triggers. That's, that's my good person, person responding. When I can, when I can flip it, you know, to not deny them, I'm actually also now creating a space where, where they're, lived experience is valued, right? As opposed to doing double harm. First, I made the mistake. And then I told them their lived experience wasn't legitimate. I, I, I said to them, well, it's not raining where I am. So I guess it's not raining where you are. That's in essence what I do with denial. And the key with that is that you have to have this vision, first of all, that you don't have to fight it because it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's giving you this opportunity to learn something new, which is actually cool. You can be this like nerd in the like social justice classroom where you're like, oh, this is a new, you know, this is a thing that wasn't on my radar yet. How can I learn and do better there? I think that's a great way to put it. I never thought of it that way, but I think that's sort of what I've become. It's not that I don't like sometimes lay awake at night, mortified by it. Um, and it's by no means a game, but it is, it, it, there, there's this like, satisfaction with getting better at it and knowing that um, the harm I've done in the past, I can, I can lessen that in the future. And, and it's, what, it's worth noting that this is hard. I mean, a lot of the social psychology research suggests it's really easy to fall into these fixed mindset patterns where we kind of go off and deny stuff. Um, and so just to get some of the science on the table, talk to me about one of these ways that we end up denying privilege in this interesting way, uh, which has a funny name. It's called this bias called the hard knock life effect. Let's just talk through that to get it on the table here. Oh, sure. I love that study. It's by, um, by my colleague, Taylor Phillips at, at NYU and, and uh, her, her co-author, Brian Lowry um, at Stanford. I love that uh, paper. So what they talk about with the hard knock life effect. So, so first this context, the, the phrase hard knock life is referring to a song in a Broadway musical in a movie called Annie. I won't have song. To sing, don't worry. <laughs> I said I was going to have you sing it. Don't worry. I was going to have you sing <laughs> oh, it. Come it's on. hard knock life for us. Yeah, see. <laughs> Folks, yeah. that's it. Thank you for coming. Yeah. That's awesome, Lori. Um, by the way, that's the third time I've got someone to sing live in the last week <laughs> on a Zoom of, of some sort. So, so I'm, I'm keeping track. Um, so in the song that you just heard, the heart, it's a hard knock life. It refers to this, this sort of the challenges, adversity that one's faced, particularly in childhood. So in this particular set of studies, what they did was they asked people to think about their childhood and to reflect on the hardships and adversity of their childhoods. Um, but the, the, the variable that they manipulated in their studies is sometimes they just ask people to do it. And sometimes, and I, I believe, um, I can't remember if they ran white participants and black participants, but they definitely had white participants in this study. So, so in, one, in one condition, they simply said, uh, you know, uh, tell me about your childhood and adversity. And in, in the other condition, the instructions were slightly different for those participants. They, they, before they said, tell me about your childhood, they said, they gave them uh, a, a quick little um, sentence that said something about uh, the, the advantages that white people have um, had in, in versus blacks in the United States. 
And so it was basically a statement of what we would call group advantage. It's not saying you individually had those advantages, but as a group. And what then they looked at what the responses were. And what they found was the people essentially rewrote their personal histories. Like they, it doesn't even appear that it was necessarily a conscious, like they don't have evidence that it was a conscious process, but that they, they literally cited more challenges and more adversity in their lives in the condition where they were reminded of group advantage. And so I, what I take away from these studies is this, 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 how hard our minds will work, even without us directing it consciously to protect our identities, that good person identity, that deserving person identity, that I have not taken any advantage uh, away from anyone else. And so um, in those studies, what, what people were revealing, I think if I remember right in the papers, they were, the, 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 the scholars were saying, that while group advantage, a lot of people buy into group advantage, they found evidence that people didn't necessarily dispute that there were these group advantages based on race. What they, what they resisted was that they individually incurred that group advantage. And so that's where, that's where this hard knock life retelling of our personal histories kicks in. And so, so, so you know, there's some, there's some like work we have to do around, we intellectually understand a lot of this data, but do we really internally accept that we may be beneficiaries of it, that we may be in fact, even propagating it? Um, and the data suggests we are, we are beneficiaries and we are propagating it, you know, you know, depending on what dim dimension of identity we're talking about, but if we're not black, we're probably benefiting from some biases, um, racial biases that are deeply hurting others. Yeah, and, and the power that, you know, without us realizing it, our minds are just going to go to data, like they're just going to look up statistics that make us feel like, oh, we, we, we personally couldn't have been as privileged, like other white people, other straight people, you know, other, you know, Ivy League, you know, employees, like they benefit, but not me personally. I mean, I just That's find right. it so striking. Um, and so, so this is all in the domain of, you know, trying to have a growth mindset so that when, when things are pointed out to you, like you can not deny them, you cannot try to like, you know, find other evidence and so on. But, but there are other ways that our kind of good person mindset gets in the way too, even in cases where we're like trying to act. Um, and that's kind of what you refer to in the book as something like cookie seeking. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about this because this these are cases where we're, we're not denying, like we're actually, we're trying to take action to fix things, but we're doing this in a way that's like a little bit kind of benefiting us rather than the people we're trying to help. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So the phrase cookie seeking, I, this is another one where I don't know who to attribute it to. We tried hard to figure out the original source, but it, it, it's a phrase that is used pretty widely in, the, in activist communities. Um, and it speaks to this centering we sometimes do. So, um, you know, let's say uh, I have a Black colleague and, um, you know, I've lately been trying to educate myself. I've, I've, I've you know, I went and read the new Jim Crow. Um, I, I read Cast. I read The Warmth of Other Suns. And so, so I sort of somehow find a way to work it into my conversation. In this example, I'm not Black. I'm, I'm me. I'm not Black. Um, I somehow find a way to work it into a conversation with my Black colleague, uh, you know, because I'm sort of waiting for them, you know, again, it may not be totally conscious, but I'm, I say it and then I like do that little micro pause where you're waiting for them to be like, oh, oh good for you. You know, like that's a little bit of a cookie seeking behavior. You know, I notice myself even doing it like outside of issues around identity, even in like my own marriage, you know, that um, my husband right now during the pandemic is, is his work is outside the home. Uh, so really I should be feeling bad for him. He's, you know, an essential worker out there, but, but instead I'm home with the kids. And so when he gets home, I sort of do all sorts of like, I don't, overtly whine, but I kind of drop in a whole bunch of like how hard today was kind of a little waiting with those little micro pauses to be validated, yeah. to be given a cookie. And that's all fine and good, except for the fact that what I've just done there is instead of centering the people I'm trying to support, if we go back to my black colleague, mm -hmm. I'm reading those books because I am trying to do better when it comes to racism. But instead what I've done is just added to the burden of racism because I've now asked this colleague 
to see me and validate me. And it's exhausting. And it happens on a constant basis in big ways and small ways. That's what cookie seeking is. And the story I tell in the book about it is, um, is a former student of mine actually who uh, identifies as queer and, and worked at, at the time a very progressive company in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And the Orlando Pulse shooting happened. You might remember we, we woke up that Sunday morning to that news. She was grief stricken all day Sunday. And then a Sunday night approached and she thought about going to work on Monday at a company that had all sorts of progressive policies and progressive people. And like, you know, she was dreading going to work. Why was she dreading? Not because people wouldn't care, not because there would be bigotry, but because there would be so much cookie seeking. She knew everybody would be coming to her trying to be seen, trying to be validated. Oh, you know, I been donating to the Trevor Project for years or, you know, my gay college roommate. And she felt she had no more emotional reserves to support them, that she needed to be seen and heard rather than helping them be seen and heard. So that's what cookie seeking refers to. Yeah. And I think that this is something that comes up a lot, I think, for our Black students and staff members in the context of what we've been going through in 2020, where again, well-intentioned people who are believers in equity, but because they kind of have that, I want to be seen as a good person mindset, end up putting more emotional labor on Black people because they're trying to like show off how woke they are about these kinds of things. And so. Exactly. Well said. Um, and so, so all of these things from denying the privilege to, you know, kind of seeking out some data that make you feel better about your privilege. Oh, it wasn't me. This sort of hard knock like effect, even the cookie seeking, these are all cases where like, because we really, really want to be a good person, we like deeply get it wrong, even though we're a believer. And so now I want to stretch to strategies we can use to like be the builder, right? Like not just rely on the yeah. believing part and kind of use that goodish mindset to kind of get a little bit further. And so I want to start with that on the privilege side about just the act of seeing it, right? So what are some tips given that we know we're likely to deny it or just lots of things about the headwinds and tailwinds mean we don't see these things? What can you do to like, you know, actually look there, you know, to kind of take your spy goggles on and put it on and see the privilege and the structures that you're benefiting from. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the first thing we can do is, is really just start noticing what's happening around us. I mean, this is the classic, you know, uh, yesterday my, I said, you know, uh, gosh, we're, for some reason we have no pens in this house. I cannot find a working pen. And my husband's, oh, we just, I just bought some pens. They're in the junk drawers. So I opened the junk drawer and I'm like, there is no pens in this junk drawer. Like I am looking, there's no, and he comes over and he's like, yeah, you mean this entire pack of big pens right in front of you? So part of it is we got to start seeing the big pens right in front of us. And the way I think we can do that is some audits around uh, what is like the daily consumption we're doing. So whatever it is you consume, movies, podcasts, TV shows, music, um, you read, wh wh whatever, we're all consuming something in some form, news, audit the last 10 units of that that you did. Uh, how much diversity of voice is in there? How much diversity of identity? How similar are those identities to your own? Look at your social media. Sorry, I forgot to say social media is a really big piece of consumption for, for many of us. Um, I, one really concrete place we can start is to say, Let's look at, let's audit my last 10 units of X and figure out how, if in fact there isn't enough um, range of perspectives and identities in there and enough dif difference from ourselves. And for almost all of us, there isn't. I can actively start changing that. That's an action we can easily take. By doing that, we start to notice things we haven't noticed before. You know, I tell a story in the book about when I was a kid, I, my parents sort of passed down this clock radio that was that was broken and, and it turned out where it broke was on a particular black radio station. And so as a young kid, what I didn't really understand that there were like different radio stations for, for white music and black music. So I grew up hearing like black um, talk radio in the morning and black, uh, black music, of course, but also black um, tellings of news events. Mm -hmm. And of course it was a wide range of black perspectives that I heard on that station. And when I, got old enough to realize that there was more than one radio station in the world and that other radio stations were sort of saying different things. It was this like, whoa, noticing moment. Um, so I, I'd say right there is one place we can start today 
to begin to notice things we haven't seen before, the perspectives we haven't we haven't tuned into before. And last thing I'll say on that, particularly if it's on social media that you're doing this, when we start to tune in to conversations we weren't hearing before, it's very important that we treat we treat it as if you were eavesdropping in a coffee shop. Chances are, by politeness norms, you wouldn't insert yourself into that conversation. You are a guest. You're an eavesdropper. Um, so, so the opportunity is to listen, not to argue, not to justify, not to say all white people, not all women, all men, whatever. Um, it's simply to, to pick up stuff we're not hearing. And I think another thing you said in that piece of advice I wanted to kind of like double down on, which is that you said kind of consuming these things, right? Like this, you didn't say, you know, talk to your one queer colleague about what it's like to be queer or demand that your black colleague like explain to you how she's feeling after the most recent police shooting. Like there, there's content that already exists out there. You shouldn't ask people for emotional labor to tell you what to look at, right? That's right. There, there, there is no shortage of, of uh, you know, and, and that's, which isn't to say that we should be silent. What we want to do is, um, if there's a terrible shooting of an unarmed black person, there is value in saying to a black colleague, I just want you to know I'm thinking of you and your family. Is there anything I can do to support you? Is there anything I can take off your plate today? Like, mm -hmm. I, I just want you to know, I, I don't know how you're doing today, but I just want you to know I see you. Th there may be value in that. Of course, you have to judge the individual relationship and context. So silence is actually quite destructive in those moments, but that's different than saying, can you tell me how you feel when you get pulled over? I mean, like that's asking a lot. And then, well, I don't understand, but if you just, you know, put your hands, you know, like th that's emotional labor. Right, right, right. And so that's one distinction, but I think a, a, a bigger thing I think we need to do to kind of be builders is like how we deal with the moments when our mistakes are pointed out. And mm -hmm. one of the things I think you're incredibly frank about in the book is that one of the reasons we can't be good people right now is that we're probably all gonna mess up, right? Yeah. Like you are not yourself if you are yourself from any identity that is not marginalized because of the headwind tailwind thing, you're not going to see stuff and you are going to screw up. Is that? A hundred percent. I did. I did. Um, I had a conversation with somebody I really respect last week who, who is reading my book or I just was in the middle of reading my book when I spoke to her. Um, this is someone I don't know well, I know of her, and this was the first time I was speaking with her. And and she said, can I share with you, um, I love your book, blah, 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 but uh, you, I noticed you sent her whiteness. And I was like, yeah. oh, all right, uh, what do you mean by that? And, and she proceeded to read a section of my book aloud to me, in which it was really clear I had centered whiteness. And the way I had done it is I had in that particular section of the book, I hadn't even like named that I was doing it, but I was speaking to white people without even naming I was doing it. It was just sort of as if the default is whiteness. And so I, I can now speak to you without even saying, okay, white readers, this, this little bit might be more useful to you than to others. Um, I did not do that consciously. I'm, that is not the type of book I meant to write. Um, and, uh, and yet I'm not at all surprised it happened. You know, I have also grown up trying to, you know, fit in as a, into a community of whiteness. So, so the response in that moment is really critical of, I felt the, the fixed mindset rising, but because I know to look for it, I was like, oh my gosh, what a gift. That's the moment I have to say to myself, what a gift, what a gift. She's telling me, yeah. what a gift. She's probably the millionth person who's thought it, but she's the one who's actually telling me. And so, so walk me through kind of what are the right reactions in those cases? Because I'm sure everybody, again, everybody on this webinar is gonna experience it for some identity that they might not see themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So if the, if the situation is some, like the one I just gave where somebody's like, yeah. live or you know on email or whatever giving you information about something they noticed that you didn't um that that's the key moment to say first and foremost it buys you time and it's what you mean thank you mm -hmm. thank you first and foremost wow thank you um the second thing to say is I want to understand what you're saying. If you don't understand what they're saying, uh, you know, can, can you tell me like, oh, you sent her whiteness in the book. Wow, thank you. Can you tell me where you saw me do that? The person may have the stamina to do that and they may not. And if they don't, that's not on them, it's on me. 
But if you can get an example, not because you're like, oh, well, prove it. It's more like, oh, wow, I am really grateful you saw something I didn't. So language like, thank you. Can you tell me more? I'm sorry. Let's not underestimate the power of those three words. I am sorry. I want to be clear. It's three words. It's not, I am sorry that that I offended you, or I am sorry that you were offended, or I am sorry. No, it's I am sorry. Um, We have to own our impact, even when it doesn't match our intention. In fact, especially when it doesn't match our intention. So, so I am sorry. Um, I want to learn more about that, you know, meaning I'm going to go learn more about that, or that's, that's really useful for me. I'm going to educate myself on that, or um, I'm going to go um, uh, review things I've written in the past and see if I made that same mistake. Or, you know what, I have some data I could look at to see, you know, oh, you're saying that my grading um, doesn't feel fair. I'm going to actually go back and look at past grading and see if, in fact, that pattern does show up. And, and thank you for giving me something to test in the data I have. We all have data. No matter what you do for a living, you have some Whatever you do is in fact data. Your daily actions and daily behaviors are data. You may or may not be collecting it and documenting it, um, but that is in fact data that you could look at. So let me look at it. Let me learn more about it. Thank you. I am sorry. These are all great places to start that conversation. And so that's that's kind of when you mess up, when, which is so important, right, to kind of react correctly because we're going to mess up. But there are other things we need to do as a builder, which is to step up. Right, which is to maybe be the one pointing out when we notice other cases of bias or when we notice other cases of bigotry. And you talk when 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 somebody who's not themselves from a marginalized group uh, points this out. You talk about that in terms of what's called ordinary privilege. And so walk us through ordinary privilege and kind of why it's so important that people from non-marginalized identities use that to fix things. Yeah, absolutely. So this brings us back a little bit to our headwinds and tailwinds. So, you know, if we if we think of privilege um, as the places where we have the tailwinds and then I'm going to call ordinary privilege is the places where I have the tailwinds that are so ordinary in my day to day life. I don't even think about them. So straightness for me is in the form of ordinary privilege. I don't have to think about it because I don't have to navigate it, as I mentioned earlier. And so those parts of our identity that that we I think there's there's a national conversation around privilege where we might feel shame around that identity if we're willing to acknowledge it. I'm actually heartened by the studies, the many studies that show that we actually, that ordinary privilege gives us influence. And so, for example, there's studies that show that if um, a racist joke is told and a white person says, hey, that wasn't cool, Versus a black person says, hey, that wasn't cool. You know, controlling for all the things we control for in good rigorous experiments. The black person will not be taken as seriously than the white person who challenges the racist joke. That there's an attribution made of entitlement or whininess, even though it was the same joke and the same response. Mm -hmm. So what did we take from that? Well, the white person might feel like it's not my place to speak up on this. So they, they might think I shouldn't say anything, but what the data is saying is that actually you have more influence than probably A, you realize, and B, than the black person will in this moment, which doesn't mean I should talk over the black person, but it does mean that I shouldn't be silent or accepting. And in that moment, I think we have ordinary privilege that we can access. The part of my identity I think about least, which, possibly for for some white people might be their race. That might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think of your identity. Um, That might be the exact place where you have more influence than you realize your ordinary privilege. And it's also just kind of, it's perhaps more effective or at least that's what the data suggests. It's more effective if in this case of a racist joke, if you're a white person, you speak up. It's also like helpful in that like, you know, it sucks more like if you're the a black person who's sitting there when a racist joke is being told or a racist statements being said, right? Like there's just such emotional labor that you go yes. through if you're from a marginalized identity that to like take that labor off the plate of the marginalized person could be incredibly powerful in all these contexts from race to gender to all this. Exactly. And the, that's exactly right. And then the, the third benefit I will add to that is that 
we, it looks like we tend to underestimate. We think, oh, it's not going to matter if I say anything. The person's going to get defensive or argue with me or belittle me. And that's true. That often does happen. But what studies also show is there does seem to be an impact, though, in the behavior of the individual. Not always. I'm not claiming this is always going to happen. But they're, they're, we, we, see, we interpret a defensive response as we got nowhere. The data suggests otherwise. That's great to hear. And that was actually, I would say, one of the most common questions we received before this webinar is this question of like, how do I engage when I hear these tiny micro, not tiny, but like, you know, important yeah. questions at work? Um, you know, how do I like point out bias without seeming holier than now? I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's a kind of interesting thing that these data show is that as the pointer outer, you're focused again, kind of on yourself. Like, I don't want to seem holier than now. Or I don't want to seem like a snob or it's not my place, but actually, if you're in a goodish mindset, what you're paying attention to is the outcome, right? Like you want these behaviors to stop. You want to fight these systems and these structures that make things feel so unequal for people from different backgrounds. I think that's exactly right. Like we, we, if we're centering our own comfort, if we're not willing to spend some of that comfort, then, then we are centering ourselves. I mean, there is value though in thinking about, again, back to heat and light, like let's be intentional. If that's for you going to be a light based moment where you actually want to change minds, then you're going to have to think about like what influence strategies are you going to use? If that's going to be a heat based moment where you just want to make the other person very uncomfortable and challenge what they did and puncture the norm, then, then you can take that approach and, and be effective in that kind of way. Um, but, but absolutely we, we, in, in that moment when the, 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 um, the, the opportunity to speak up happens. Uh, we, we, if we wait for it to feel comfortable, we almost never will. And that I think is just a message that I think everyone on this call needs to hear, right? Like this is supposed to be uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Like, it is almost always uncomfortable for people from certain identities, right? Like they don't get to avoid this discomfort. That's exactly right. I'm so glad you said that. I was trying to like, string that thought together and didn't quite get there exactly like we, we if 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 the, if the discomfort of living in a society where racism occurs on a daily basis is being borne by black people and they can't walk away from that then why should the rest of us be able to walk away from that that is in fact what privilege means right and so we kind of have to dive in and so then then let's sort of get to some like practical strategies for the, the final kind of thing we talked about that we can end up doing if we're in that good mindset that we don't want to do it, which is the, with the cookie seeking stuff, right? The okay. like kind of centering yourself as, hey, I'm this woke person and I'm trying to do good. Um, how do we get over that? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing is like, just, just stepping into, okay, let's do it this way. Like, Everybody right now, think about something that you've gotten better at, you know, like baking, basketball, anything Bulgarian, like I, I was trying to go with the bees, uh, the, the, whatever, think of, just take a moment in your mind, think of the thing you got better at and think about how it felt at the beginning when you started doing it and then how it felt as you got better. And if you were to sort of come up with one word to describe like the emotion of that, um, you know, when I do this with students, they say things like exhilarating or proud or struggle or um, uh, better, you know, that, that's the feeling we want to have in this domain. And we can. What we tend to have in this domain is feelings like shame and you know discouragement or confusion or things like that. So we want to replace, like we, we really want to come at this from a place of it feels good to get better at something. And I can get better at this. This is being goodish. This is a growth mindset. Um, and then once we do that, like I, I think we can begin to act in ways that we haven't acted on before that aren't cookie seeking, instead of sort of showing to others what we're doing, we're now almost like, you know, showing to ourselves, we're seeking the cookie from ourselves, if that makes any sense, that we are in fact noticing things, acting on things, asking questions. You know, sometimes it's literally, can we ask some questions? Um, you know, well, what, uh, you know, for this particular job that we're hiring for, I noticed the job description says, uh, must have a four-year college degree. You know, can I ask about that? What, 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 
what do you see as essential in, in the job description around the four-year college degree? I mean, it's worth asking a question. Or um, I noticed that, um, you know, in meetings, uh, I noticed that people always sit, you know, in this particular configuration. I guess we don't sit in meetings anymore, but like, but you know what I mean? Um, or, or I noticed that, that you know, we, 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 um, we, we invite these people to the Zoom and we, we don't include this level of employee. I was wondering about that. I wonder if we've ever tried inviting the full staff to the Zoom discussion. Um, just asking questions begins the process. So we're not always in a position where we feel like we can just make change or even articulate the change we'd like to see, but we can almost always ask questions. And this gets to kind of my last uh, thing I wanted to talk to you about is that, you know, so far we've been talking about how we should strive to be goodish people, you know, but you're here as part of this event where we're talking about belonging at Yale. And so I wanted you to riff a little bit on how we can become kind of goodish organizations or goodish universities, right? Are all the strategies that you just talked about for the individual people watching this right now, you know, how do those apply in the context of like Yale University, say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's that's actually, I think, one of the, the coolest things that I, um, I felt my own understanding emerge in working on this book was I'm trained to think about individuals like as a social psychologist. Um, but there was this realization that what individuals are the part of institutions and communities and that what we are noticing, the butter we're not noticing the, in the fridge or the, the, the pens we're not noticing in the junk drawer that what we're not noticing are the systems around us. So when we start noticing more, when we, we, we give ourselves permission to notice more, and then we do notice more, we will start to, those systems will become visible. So um, if I was a member of, of, of your community, I would just start to, to think about the ways in which I might be benefiting from certain systems and what are the ways in which I could start nudging others um, to notice that, that noticing as well. And the, the best way to do that, by the way, I, I think earlier you mentioned the holier than thou, and I don't think I addressed that directly. The best way to do that is to make your own learning visible to others. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that means is this isn't about, I know more than you. This is about, I, I have been trying to figure something out and hey, like we're all working on this big puzzle. You're on that part, I'm on this part. I think I got this corner figured out. Let me tell you how, how to do it. Um, and so making our own learning visible to others is really powerful. So I think in the community at Yale, there's just, there's a tremendous opportunity to assume that there's syst- systemic problems. Let's just assume it's true. Mm-hmm. I promise you it is. There's no way Yale, as amazing a place as it is, has somehow been immune from 400 years of history and, and, you know, widespread isms in society. So the question isn't, do our systems need to be addressed? It's, it's just how. And then I think another thing you talk about in your book a lot, which I think is important in the context of organizations too, is kind of passing the mic, right? Like when you get the opportunity really to listen to people from different backgrounds and hear what their lived experience is like. Yeah, that's really powerful. And that's another way in which we cookie seek as we talk more than we listen. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great uh, little acronym that Michael Bungay Stanier uh, came up with called, it was in a completely different context. It was context of coaching, but he, he calls it the weight rule, the why am I talking rule. And I found that really useful um, in every context, not just these contexts, like the kinds I study, but in all contexts, the why am I talking rule? Um, but particularly, uh, when we cookie seek, we are usually talking. There's almost always words coming out of our mouth. Yeah, and then I think that sort of builds up to like another question, which is this idea that, you know, we, if you're from a majority group, you're often benefiting from these structures, right? Like when we think about the structural changes that we'll make at Yale, evening things out means that there's gonna be some people who are kind of having the tailwinds kind of go down a little bit, but there's this worry that that might mean, you know, the headwinds are gonna go down a little bit too. And so what advice do you have for people who kind of wanna make these systemic changes when they realize they, they might be kind of facing the possibility that some people perceive, you know, things getting more just 
as things getting unfair, you know, for the like the non-marginalized folks who kind of feel like, well, you know, why would, would I as a white man have to talk less? Or why would I as a straight person have to, you know, think differently? Or why would I as an able-bodied person have to worry about, you know, text on my screen or something like that? Like what advice do you get when you kind of get that criticism brought to you? Yeah, well, we, I have some, um, uh, it's unpublished data. It's, a, it's a, a paper we're still working on, but we've got some data that suggests that what helps us stay engaged or get more engaged in those moments is connecting, um, connecting it to a bigger picture. So, and this is very consistent also with like uh, sort of classic work in psychology around affirming the self and, and creating affirmations. Uh, I don't mean like affirmations, like things you stand in the mirror and look at, but, and say to yourself, but, but just uh, in, in, in the jargon of our field, um, sort of uh, reflecting on your own values is one form of affirmation. And what research shows is that when you connect those, those moments that you're experiencing, those that are specifically around you and your interests and your ego, if you can, if you can connect it to a bigger picture, that seems to create greater resilience for us around our self-image, around our ego. Um, I, it, it, it is true in any one given moment, there might be a fixed pie, right? In any one given moment, there might be, you know, one job or, or one whatever. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, we tend to underestimate how much the pie can grow. You know, in negotiations research, they see this all the time. They call it the mythical fixed pie, that we think my loss is your gain and vice versa. Uh, when in fact, there's actually many more opportunities for m multiple people, myself and others to gain than I realize. Um, I also, you know, if, if, I, if I'm to be a little more kind of um, pushy on this, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, I don't even think we have the option to wait anymore. And I, I think that moment came and went where you can sort of choose to opt out of these conversations. Um, I, I think we're now in the midst of dramatic change, long overdue. And uh, it's, it's time as a builder to sort of figure out what your role is gonna be in advancing that change as opposed to worrying about if the change should happen or if the change will benefit me. Um, the change is a lot better chance of benefiting you if you're part of it than if you're resisting it. Um, and so I think that's true no matter how you look at it in terms of cultural norms, in terms of demographics in this country, I think in terms of um, sort of what skills are being valued by employers, um, and admissions officers, uh, no matter how you look at it, one is better off taking the stance of, I am going to be building this change and part of it, than as opposed to questioning it and resisting it. And then my final question for you tonight kind of talks a little bit about where we are in 2020 right now, where you know these conversations are more needed than ever, more important than ever, but they can also be a little bit exhausting. And so this is kind of ending with a little bit of a personal question. You know, you are, you know, central in this fight for justice, central in this fight of kind of getting people to think about being goodish people and so on. But that fight can be kind of exhausting sometimes. And I think, you know, on behalf of all of our activists, this is a number, another set of questions that we got a lot of is like, how do you kind of protect your mental health in the face of this stuff? You know, how do you protect your mental health in the face of like, you know, turning on the heat when people really seem like they're not listening or even, yeah. you know, giving light and, you know, doing the light version and getting a lot of pushback, right? Like, how do you protect yourself in the face of all this stuff? Yeah, it, it really is exhausting and it is important because we want people in it for the long haul. Um, you know, I wrote uh, back in June, uh, you know, maybe three weeks after George Floyd was murdered, I decided to start this newsletter that you referred to earlier, Dear Good People. And, and it was exactly for that reason. It was that I was seeing um, folks who were already exhausted, now really exhausted, um, and then other people sort of joining the conversation or trying to deepen their investment. And I was worried about by July, August, September, October, where was everyone gonna be? Was it, where were our exhausted people gonna be burned out? And were our newer people going to have lost interest or, or confidence. Um, so I wrote this piece called the 10% more rule. And um, it's on my website, dollychug.com newsletter, but I'll just, I'll just summarize it. Uh, basically, 
I think what we all want to do is 10% more. If you're new to this conversation um, or new, new to this understanding, then 10% more means, means uh, be 10% more mortified. Mm-hmm. Like don't look away, keep, keep, stay engaged. Does it, that means we need you to keep reading and watching and listening and learning. If you've been in this conversation, um, you know, you've hashtagged, you've donated, you've volunteered, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, if this was a basketball game, you were spending more time on the bench than in the game, mm-hmm. taking hard fouls. Um, now it's time to be 10% uh, more terrified. That means get in the game, take a hard foul, take a risk, essentially, start saying things at work, start asking questions, start reaching out, when, start spending your comfort. And then finally, to the group you just referred to, um, those who've been on the front lines fighting so hard at great detriment to themselves at times, they're in every way, physical, emotional, financial. Um, The 10% more refers to 10% more, and these, I'm gonna do air quotes, satisfied. And by that, I mean, not satisfied with the state of affairs at all, but satisfied that you can come out of the game. You can, you don't have to play every minute. You can let everyone else get in the game a little bit, um, learning about the game and playing the game. You can step out and catch your breath 10% more than you have been and then come back in. And I think that's the key is that if we're going to be sustainable in this, um, the, one of the metaphors I share in the book that uh, uh, someone I interviewed uh, offered me as a flock of birds. And apparently when you see V formations of birds flying about this time of year, that the lead bird, the one that's fighting those headwinds, is rotating. It isn't always the same bird, which I did not know. Um, but it's for this exact reason that if the lead bird was going to stay the lead bird all the way to their final destination, they literally aren't going to make it to the final destination. So let's rotate out. So um, I, I would say 10% more if you're on the front lines means 10% less, essentially. Not forever, just catching your breath. Well, I love, I think this is a fantastic place to end because honestly, I think if we really want to achieve belonging at Yale, if literally all the hundreds and hundreds of people on this call did 10% more at Yale of working to be a good-ish person um, and fighting so that everyone at Yale feels like they belong, I feel like we'd make a lot of progress towards making this institution a better place. Um, But I wanted to end by thanking Dolly so deeply. I know, I hope you all see now why she's so fantastic and her work is so fantastic. Again, just to give her a couple of plugs, you should check out her book, uh, which I think she'll hold up right now if she's sitting right near it. Um, Her book, The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias. It's fantastic and really worth a read. Um, You can also, even if you need more bite-sized chunks, check out her newsletter, which she mentioned, Dear Good People, which you can check out at dollychug.com slash newsletter. Um, Thank you everyone for joining today and for joining the fight uh, to get Yale to be a place where everyone belongs. Um, I hope I will see you at the next anti-racism webinar. You know, stay tuned to Yale News where you'll hear more about that. Um, Ibram Kendi will also be fantastic. Um, And thank you to all the organizers for putting this together. Really appreciate having you here today. Thanks.